treasures. And we can find comfort and warmth in the hospitality of Ben and Carrie, and we thank them for their hospitality this afternoon. And of course, we can find comfort and warmth in all of you. We're so glad to see the house so full, the museum so full this afternoon. As we continue to investigate, to explore, to examine imagination and creativity, and to define each time visual literacy and exactly what is visual literacy and how it impacts us. All of the lectures this year about visual literacy are part of a series. This is the third of a series. And the series is the Richard E. Wilkin College of Liberal Arts Faculty Chair Lecture Series. And it is named for Dr. Richard E. Wilkin. And Mrs. Barbara Wilkin, please wave. <laughs> this is the 11th year of the Wilkin Chair Series. Thank you for your continued support. This afternoon, we also would like to welcome and to uh, introduce our 16th president of the University of Findlay, President Emeritus, Dr. DeBeau Freed. And the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, Dr. Ron Tully. and Patricia Luther, Patty Luther, for her continued support of the liberal arts, of the fine arts, through an endowment that she and John established. And we certainly support, thank her for her support, her financial support this afternoon. Thank you to all of these folks for your genuine and continued interest in the liberal arts and in the fine arts. Our three guests today, we have three, Chant Rosen, <laughs> Michael J. Rosen, and Stan Fellows. Chant provides the inspiration, the content, the context of a story. And Michael J. takes that and puts it into beautiful words of poetry and story. And Stan provides the pictures, but more than just pictures, Stan provides a visual narrative. So we have this beautiful package of inspiration, of words, and images. And we're mesmerized from page one to page two, through the book to the very end, and then we're invited to start back in again. It is delightful to have these friends of the Mazza Museum, longtime friends who've been here before, many of you have met them before. We're delighted to have Chant and Michael J. and Stan, part of the Mazza family, back home again. Please welcome them. That's a screensaver, not part of the program. Right? <laughs> uh, honored, as always, to share time with all of you and, and uh, those of you in the peripheral. Um, honored in the sense that each of us could take a turn at the microphone, doing
doing something based on what we spent the lion's share of our lives doing. Uh, Stan often talks about the fact that for 37 years, he's painted two or three watercolors a day, totaling upwards of, what, 37,000 paintings. Maybe someone here is a bread maker and could say, well, as it turns out, I do 25 loaves five days a week, and I've done it for 20 years, and I'd love to see you knead the bread. <laughs> and the rest of us would go, you know, maybe some of you are, in other words, we each have a certain level of, of perfection that our practice and our passion and makes. So the two of us, I think, are, are talking today about visual literacy in a way that says, how can we have an idea, could be imagined one, or an idea meaning, oh, this is a real story, um, how do we bring it from an actual experience, it happened, or I imagine that it happened, it's vivid to me that it happened, but that's me. How is it going to be vivid to you again? I gotta come up with something to communicate that, right? One of them could be, I meet people all the time that say, oh, I wrote the most charming story, I have to find a publisher. Every time I read it to my son or my classroom, they just love it, they love it, they love it, they ask for more. But that medium is personality and relationship and rapport. If you pick up the tale of rescue and you don't know me, you're like, what relationship? What rapport? You say from page one, prove it. Interest me. Or, mm, never mind. I mean, if I wanted to tell a story about wintertime and how cold it was, say, Today, and I merely. Oh, that was you, baby. Uh, and I merely told you what you already knew about today. Why would you read to page two? For example, I could do this. Um, I woke up and there was frost on the window pane, and when I went outside, the car was covered with, with frost. It was slippery getting there. You know, I could give you the. I always think of the show Family Feud. You know where most people think of the same, if you tell me a sign of winter, you'd raise your hand, you'd say rosy cheeks. You'd use the word rosy and you'd say cheeks as opposed to, but what if you said there was a little girl this morning that we were talking about winter and she said that she gets a drip on her nose. <laughs> and I said, yeah, and I said, do you know what this is called? This little crease in your, no, and I said, I actually forgot the name of it as well. I meant to look it up. We're the only creature on earth that hasn't. But if you, know, if you just said, here's an example, a sign of someone being very, very tuned and attentive to a very common phenomenon, but that might make you pay attention, you could say, oh, I just felt that drop of moisture on my nose travel in the crease from my lips and then make a left turn onto my lower lip. You're very much aware of, of what happened. And what is it then, visual literacy-wise, that I do as a writer and stand as a painter that isn't merely like a tennis game where I love to stand, hey, draw a dog, there's a dog. Draw a farm, there's a farm. There's something that's much more exploratory. And some of the points that we're gonna make today I'd sort of like to tell you in advance so that you know when you hear them, oh, that was an important point, <laughs> is that, number one, um, you've heard it all before, right? You've heard it all before, right? Someone dies, yeah, I've heard about people dying before. It got cold, yeah, I heard about that before. But why do we continue to write about that? It's because we never listen. We've heard it all before, but we actually never listen, or we forget. We were listening, and then we forgot. And that's what's amazing about us. If we didn't forget, if we remembered every single person whose death ravished our lives, if we remember every grief, every, no, we need to forget, and we need art to remind us. Another point, can you include <coughs> details that just elaborate, elaborate, elaborate? Or do you include details that tell you story? Does something do more than just one thing? Does it do a lot of things? We'll get back to these. Um, 
I want to only tell you this much. So if, for example, um, I reached out to you like this, right, you would know, oh, yeah, you're shaking my hand. I get the idea I'm supposed to do the same thing, right? <coughs> so most of what we do is, and Stan I know has lots to say about this, this idea of I will go this far and I know that you will provide this much. Because do I want to shake hands with myself? Not so much. So there's a moment in writing and in painting when you make sure that you're shaking hands with your viewer, reader, listener, and not with yourself. The last couple. We want to go from not knowing to knowing. Most bad writers, most kids, start from, oh, oh, I know. And then they tell you. And then, and then if they have to write, write it, they just go ahead and write it. I want them to go, oh, um, I, well, wait, I don't know. And there, there's the moment to say. So for example, in writing The Tale of Rescue or, or any of the books that I've done, I deliberately try to get into a position where I don't have a solution and I have to try some things. And when I find a solution, it reveals. Um, it reveals something else. So we'll go back to this idea of knowing and not knowing, and which comes first. Um, and, the, and the last one was, was, was what I said as, here's experience, here's words, or here's pictures. How do you get an experience? So what is that prism of art that allows one experience to yield, generate, project another experience. Um, that's what we're going to try to struggle with. Do you want to add other points? To, I just figured I'd give us the topic. Uh, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. I think that's outstanding. Again, yeah, that's that, that's the overview of the things that we've talked about. You and I talked about for twenty, how many years? I should say, Stan and I met. Um, 20 some years ago, Stan contributed to Speak, which is in the permanent collection here at Masa. It travels around. It was a book that benefited animal welfare efforts. He then contributed to Dog People. He illustrated uh, a, a Horse People, another book actually we have here available. The Cuckoo's Haiku, a collection of bird haiku that I wrote, The Tale of Rescue. And we have a forthcoming collection of horse I can chant. That's probably a less good idea. So you feel free. Um, so yes, we'll, we'll get started and we'll share some of this. And I thought just to, to warm us up, I would go ahead. And have a brief introduction by chance. I am an Australian stumpy tail cattle dog. Yes, that's a real breed. We're healers, bred to nip the heels, get it, of things that need to move faster. Cows, sheep, preschool kids in a pinch. Yes, I have a stumpy tail. Sure, I would lose in the longest tail contest, but I might win in one for the shortest. And in case you're wondering, you don't need a tail to wag to show you're happy. I am. I'm three and a half. I've already been a mother. I've been lost. I've been rescued, fostered, and then adopted by home who lives in the middle of the woods in the middle of Ohio. Oddly, he has no cows or sheep. <laughs> so he's the sole member of this cattle dog's herd. Home does have cats, things in the woods I can hunt, and books, over a hundred, not that it's a cattle dog's job to count. But my first book is just coming out. To be clear, I didn't write it, and I didn't paint the pictures. Holmes' friend, Stan Fellows, did. But I was the inspiration and the model for the pictures. It's about a mother and father from Florida who bring their son to Ohio for his first experience of a real winter. And as all snowmen 
sledding in winter wonderland until a blizzard descends and the family gets lost in the whiteout. From off in the distance, the healer, that's me, hears a faint whistle and turns her inexhaustible attention from her cattle to finding the family. How do I get three exhausted, panicked strangers stranded in waist-deep snow in the middle of nowhere to the warmth of a far-off cattle farm? That's the tale of rescue, which Kirkus described as a fine, superbly illustrated tale of adventure, bravery, and loyalty, a starred review. If home had a tale, it wouldn't stop playing. Okay, so there's a little bit of jam. Um, why don't we start with this point of, let me get that out of there. Um, so this part of, how do we describe something that's familiar to people and have them um, recognize the moment, recognize themselves, uh, call upon memories, do the, I'm going to give you enough so that you can bring forward something more. So let me just say at this point, there's a family from Florida who's come to Ohio to experience real winter, and they have all those fun and games as Chant was suggesting. And then they're caught in a blizzard, in a whiteout. The snow was already many foot deep, and now it's up to the kids' waists. And they've decided to, to hunker down into this frozen, they made like a little bunker. They don't know where they're going. Ice is now forming, it's raining on them. It's a pretty miserable, awful, and I'd take several pages to kind of talk about that. But let me just zoom in on this one moment when the dog, a dog finds them, this cattle dog, finds them in the blizzard, and I'm just gonna read a couple of paragraphs. My hope this will demonstrate, and I'm gonna turn this over to Stan to do a sort of similar thing. Um, not what is the obvious thing, but something that might begin to reach toward you in a, that handshake of experience that might have you do that wonderful thing that we do as readers or, or viewers. We get lost in the thought. We have to go back and reread. We were thought Sorry. We were lost in our own thoughts. We remembered something else. It reminded us, right? You were paying attention, except you did that wonderful thing of being between the lines with the, with the text. The boy rested his cheek on the wet dog's chilled coat. When a tear spilled across his cheek, its warmth surprised him. The furnace inside him could still heat the water in his eyes. A second later, it cooled on the dog's cold fur. But as he held his face against her silver black coat, her body heat rose and eased the frost's rawness on that patch of his skin. He placed the other side of his face on the dog. He tugged the mittens from his numb fingers and slid his hands under the dog's belly. Once his own flesh thawed the clumps of ice that clung to her fur, the dog's heat radiated into his palms. Soon, six cold hands flattened beneath the cattle dog's body. What a wan furnace the four creatures built with their body's heat. All right, so just, a, just, that's just a moment where I wanted to say, okay, here's this moment when the dog's in their laps. He's you know, climbed into this hole with them. And they're having this tactile experience with a strange dog that a moment ago they're terrified of. And I wanted to find what could I show you to show that intimacy of them all huddling together, the pain of the cold, the wetness of the dog, the heat of the dog, and the exchange of warmth that <coughs> happened between, you know, tear, cold, 
uh, flesh, hands, paw, belly, ice, melting. So this is not me patting myself on the back at all. This is me saying, how do you problem solve such a moment? How do I convey to you what I wanted you to feel with that, with that insulated moment of rawness and, and uh, proximities? Yeah, that's just a terrific passage. Uh, I'm still experimenting with this. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Let's try. Oh, I can email it. Yeah. something that, that our editor and publisher knows about the two of us is that my instinct uh, as an artist is exactly like Michael's. I hear a passage like that and it draws me into that story. I am there in that snow with those with that family. And the same sort of slowness, uh, attention to what is actually going on, not what's a predictable postcard of the scene, but if I were there, what would I feel? What would, it, what would I smell? What would the things be that are happening? And so I instinctively then, as I'm going through the manuscript, am doing that same thing. Uh, there, I, I do not believe there is any mention of prose. Right? Correct. Okay. So the, the story uh, unfolds and things are getting ominous. It's getting a little spooky. These people do not yet know that their life is about to be in great trouble. And they deal with a cheerful snowman and, uh, you know, they're still having fun. And I thought, as I'm standing there, the thin edge of the woods, knowing where this is headed. What's a way to say that without saying that? And I thought, well, there's the uh, cheerful snowman. Um, I can open that. Yeah, let's see if we can find that. That was a study for that. <coughs> the, Oh, that's a little bit later. Oh, maybe this one. That, that's fine. There's this. Uh, there's the family, oblivious, and the, the point of view, the camera and the crow. It's just kind of a creepy sense that something is off. They are not aware of something that's coming up behind them. It turns out to be a storm. But rather than show, okay, here comes the big scary storm, what is something that gives that same sense to us? Uh, uh, when you are actually out a field in a situation like this, or in an urban situation, can sometimes be silence. All the birds just went quiet. What's going on? Yeah, so it's looking for that stuff that's convincing uh, and not expected is one of the things that's really fun. And it, it's fun for me because working with Michael's uh, work, uh, okay. Uh, you know, I know he has that same sensibility, and you know, when I illustrate to what he's writing, it's it's going to be the same stuff. I just got an indication. Can you hear me in the back? A louder. It's kind of hard because if I yell into this thing, it's going to be taking pictures of the walls. <laughs> Let me go ahead and, um, this is still working too, right? 
That'd be great. Um, let's just for a second uh, try to get an example that I could show you that would be um, from the Cuckoo's Haiku, which is a smaller moment that. Um, so I live out where there are wild turkeys. So does Chan. And uh, we often see them. And what's remarkable is to me, here's a sketch that Stan did of this. Um, I'm going to show you all this stuff, but sorry, it's kind of like that. Right. So here's how I would start I'm in the woods, I'm walking, I see there are wild turkey tracks. Do you know what they look like? They look like arrows that are in the that are in the that are in the snow. And we often walk, and I'll see chance footprints among them. And I and I come in from a walk like that, and I think, well, you know, I might try to write something about that to try to catch it for someone who hasn't seen or maybe who has seen this. And so I want to try to do this this thing where I stay on it. I don't come up with an idea and then execute it. But I come up with an idea, and I tumble it like a cabochon, and I'm trying to develop a sort of polish in. Or I, I weigh it back and forth, and maybe like a slinky, toss it around with no expectation that I need to get it right. And I think one of the things that I try to teach often with younger or, or, or apprentices, you know, people that are just apprenticing themselves, themselves to writing, is to enjoy that sense of, I don't know yet, it's still coming, there are some options. So for this, I just wanted to pick up on the idea that what's so funny is it seems like they're pointing a direction to you. They're clearly arrows. And then I was naive enough not to you know, put two and two together, but to think, oh, I'm going to follow where they've been, and I go in the direction <laughs> the arrow is pointing. And of course, that's walking backwards for, you know, for, the, for them. So, so there would be the assignment. That's all I have. I want to say something about mistaking the fact that they're pointing in the direction that they're actually not going. But only I, oh, you know, the dog doesn't think, oh, they're going in the wrong direction. The turkeys certainly don't. But we do from what we bring to this. So that was my idea. <clears throat> now I know what a haiku is, or at least how I practice making haiku. I'm going to put it in three lines. We're going to have so many syllables. And I'd like it to have this instant this sort of snapshot of, of a moment. So all of those things present a challenge in words that I then, once I get, using that same metaphor, I don't simply lob it over the net in a serve and expect stand the fire and back to me. But to, to enjoy the play of, well, from what vantage should I do this? Just as I might say, from what uh, point of view should I do this? Should I dress the wild turkey? Should it be me? Should I point to the tracks first? Should I? So as it turns out, here's, or not, um, here's the drawing that Stan did, the painting, I'm sorry, the watercolor that Stan did of this finally. And just to say what the haiku is, and then maybe I'll let Stan sort of suggest uh, you know, his own uh, thought of this. Very simple, wild turkeys, snow tracks. Their arrows point us one way, they go the other. Again, hoping that you would immediately catch that and see that, as opposed to me explaining it and for you to go, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Well, some of the stuff, uh, some of the solutions, I, I'd forgotten about this piece, but as I look at it now, I can see uh, there, there is a flow. Oh, there they go, off that way. And then the little inset uh, painting of the turkey is that looking back, which uh, plays off of the, off of the poem. But now I'm going this way. <laughs> Who's that writing poetry back behind me? <laughs> Leaping, so it's, in some ways your inventions aren't in the same tense as what's happening. 
you've talked about, like I remember in, in, in Rescue, I had a moment where, oh, I thought surely you were going to do this moment, and you did it the moment after that happened, right. and they were about to move away. Right. Yeah, often, uh, often an effective visual <coughs> you know, is the, you know, the author says, a thing happened. What was the expression on that person or their gesture just before that happened? Or right after that happened? Um, or something that would suggest they are about to discover this thing. And it may not be in the manuscript, but if you were into the story and you know, in that kind of immersion, like, oh, I know it will be fun. And it's the thing Michael was talking about a minute ago. I'm going to give the viewer this much information. And my favorite illustrations, paintings, is when it takes a minute. The person looks at it and says, okay, it's just a big shape. Oh wait, there's something in this dark. It's dark against dark. And you know, uh, with a very straightforward book, uh, the, the publisher would say, well, no, if you're going to draw a bird, or in this case, a dog, the dog's dark and should be against a light background so we can really see the dog. Well, yeah. What if we do just the opposite? A dark dog against a dark background and then white over here. <coughs> First, it's just a shape. Then you discover, oh, it's just rimlet. There's a little stuff here, and it's the dog. And why is the dog turning its head? And why are these crows in the background taking off? And the viewer then fills in the story. It says, oh, this is just before the, the dog heard something. But the text doesn't, on that page, maybe didn't talk about that talked about the people are whistling or something, you know. So it, it's, that's very satisfying to come up with that stuff that's a little off camera, a little unexpected, <coughs> and give the viewer, uh, uh, the reader, a little something to do it that's more engaging for them, more satisfying than just a literal straightforward oh, answer. That is such a perfect example of you know when you read a book and you and someone's like, oh my god, I know what's going to happen. Oh gosh, you know you have that sense of dread or anticipation, or like, oh no, and you're leaping ahead to see. That's what you're doing visually, where you're queuing up. It, maybe it's subconscious in a way. Talk talk in the same way about how we fill in. You know that, that your job is not to not to discredit any any work that's in this. You know, be precise and. And when I look at this, for example, I look at this grove of trees in the upper left-hand corner, and when I look at it really carefully, I see that all, all you've really done is smear a bunch of green and then <laughs> make some stripes in it. And I totally get that it's the grove of forest in the, right. talk about that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's uh, uh, on my drawing boards here and there, I keep writing across these same little notes to self that I I write, uh, and one of them is 5% detail on a page. I, I try to keep it at 5% the amount of detail. And here's a good example uh, in the sky. It's the top 25% of that page, zero. In the bottom, <coughs> Zero. So now we're at half this page has zero detail. Um, and it gets paid for <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I was just joking with somebody this morning that I, I teach a workshop on mindfulness and said basically I'm being paid to tell people don't think. Uh, if you just saw that, you would have no idea what it was. It's a smear, it's a texture. Same here. You get the idea that throughout here, I'm implying things uh, 
through shape and composition. And they're really trying to stay away from drawing all the boards on the side of the barn <coughs> or lots of fur on the dog. And, and I share with you that some of my favorite artists do exactly that. They can be gorgeous, not me. Uh, so for me, to, to keep my interest in the page, and I think for the viewer's interest, it's fun to look at this and like Michael just said, oh look, it's a uh, farm scene of the barn and there's the dog. And then you look more carefully to realize those trees were done with this part of my thumb. I gave the paint a shove and scratched in some lights with my fingernail and I was done. There's a grove of trees. And it's that same uh, device of allowing the viewer to participate in filling in the blanks. And, and when you do that successfully, you look at the painting and say, Oh, this reflection stuff, and then realize how little is there. That's a, that's a very enjoyable experience. I mean, I have a huge pleasure in that in that sense of, of so fully participating that I assemble a composition. You know, we have a very hard time. How many times have you looked at some abstract work and thought, maybe if I just I know it. I think it's something. Is it like a house? <laughs> you know, we like we have this longing to make sense and coherence of things. So even you know, looking at this example that I just just pulled up, we have um, you know our minds do that coherent thing of of uh, you know, it's a very gratifying experience to say, ah, I got it. I see it. I anticipate that. And his and he does this with five percent detail. In the same way. Again, not to, not to make too close a, a connection. In the same way that in that scene that I read to you about the dog amid the, the three humans, <laughs> no. I could have completed it by describing what everyone was feeling and what the wind was doing at that moment, and meanwhile, back at the whatever. But for all intents and purposes, I think you could extrapolate outward from that whatever was, was necessary. Sure, well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a beautiful scene. And that, that's, you know, when I uh, read that manuscript, uh, when I first got it, it's like, oh, the, the relief, uh, you know, partly the physical relief, the cold, the distraction from your peril, <laughs> uh, it is so understandable in that scene. Uh, there, there are no, no words in that scene that say that. That's just what you bring into the story. It's, oh, that's, I know how I would feel right there. And that's explained by hands being warmed, a tear, uh, so forth. It, it's, just, it's just genius to be able to pull that off. I'm, I'm slightly worried that we'll end up having enough that you won't get a chance to demonstrate some. Do you want to take a moment to sure. talk about that and then we'll chime back in? Okay. Uh, so, can you see this from back there? Mm -hmm. uh, all right. I'll just tell you what I'm going to do and I'll just walk it back there real quick. This is an example of, uh, this would be a study uh, for a story like this. And it's the, uh, oh, something scary is happening. Sometimes. Okay, we're good. Um, you can see you know, the dog, the outline of the dog. And if I just painted the dog like this, full oh, hum, you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, okay, so don't tell anyone outside of this room. <laughs> but, Part of the trick with painting with this approach is that it relieves you of having to be a fabulous painter. <laughs> yeah, we're not buying that one. <laughs> so, no, seriously, it's uh, the composition and the idea and how much you choose to show or not show becomes very interesting. And if you're going to just do a literal rendering of this dog, 
well, you'd better be a heck of a painter and make it interesting. And some artists can do that. Uh, I don't have the attention span for it. I'm, while you do this for one second, yeah. I, love, I love Stan's humility. Um, and, I don't, and I'm not mocking it at all here to say that him just saying that he lacks the attention span sounded kind of like funny. But I think we, because we're talking about visual literacy, that implies style and his choice. He doesn't want to do a complete rendered detail thing. I have my own style called a voice. There are things I don't do well. And in fact, we make workarounds so that for Stan, he has discovered after 37,000 paintings, actually, he discovered it somewhere along the way, uh, obviously, that for his attention to be enthralled, engaged, he needs to work in a certain way, which is probably the difference between a novelist who writes a 160-page novel and those whose natural rhythm is you know, 875 pages. The other wouldn't dream of perhaps doing the other's work. So I think this, this idea of recognizing what is your attention span and how do you maximize it? You have to care. You have to care. If you don't care, you can smell. And I, I've learned that with, uh, with career adjustments and so forth. If I don't care about the painting, people can tell. In fact, there was an interesting thing that happened. I had a gallery that sold a thousand paintings of birds through this place, and the gallery owner called me and said, I need three more. I was sick of it. So I knocked out three birds, thought, well, I have such skill, no problem. I didn't sell them. And I talked to her later, and I said, so what happened? And she said, you didn't care. Really? You're right, I didn't. But I thought they were pretty good. And she said, people can tell. If you look at a painting or writing, and if you don't care, somehow it shows. I just thought that was fascinating. I, I mean, in, in a way, it's like when you're, you talk so much about, you know, Stan does a workshop on, on stillness, on, on drawing, on being present on tuning in, you know, essentially if you let your talent suffice and you tune out the rest, you're sort of imitating yourself. You're calling on your, you know, your uh, muscle memory, as it were, to do the work and not risking, which is so profoundly involved in writing, which is why I talked about not knowing as how I start, or how one starts, you're risking I hope I know by the end of this. You know, I hope I do something well enough that I'm going to be paid for what I just did, as opposed to, yeah, rotely, I bring to the table a talent for words and language. I, I, I kind of get that. But I got to bring something else. And Stan's point about caring sounds in some ways so, like, maybe obvious or maybe uh, gentle. But it is at the, the heart of risk taking, <coughs> and at the heart of your, of uh, what else you bring to that visual literacy moment, beyond just skill. You know, beyond like I know how to handle watercolor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's critical. And, uh, you know, partly just for the, the sake of uh, the successful painting. something you have to do and it feels perfunctory. <laughs> that's that's a good feel to get out of. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just do one more real quick thing here and you'll get the idea. So here here's a funny thing. It looks like I'm dashing because I'm doing a demo. This is how fast I'm being. I, I, I really fly. At home for a book, I would slow down for 5% and take some care. 
But all this stuff you see, if you look at the other things that I've done, this is how it happens. It's, a, it's like watching a train wreck. <laughs> well, I mean, and Stan also isn't, because he's respecting the uh, property here, he's, he's uh, you know, you can take a look at his pants and see that the paint flies. And he's, uh, you know, he spatters, he drips, and that's part of, what is it that you learn as, a, as an artist or as a writer where you take those, uh, those elements as opportunities and not as, like, I remember learning to paint where every little dribble, I'm like, where is it? I have to get it up or I have to erase this, I have to remove it. When do you get the confidence to say, no, that's actually part of the process and I want you to see it? Because I want you to know this was human, a human made object. This is interesting to me, yeah, it, and it could be more so, but the me being, letting just a little bit of highlight define the dog's face, and if we are being careful, highlight on the eye, a little bit on the edge of the ear, but if you look at it like that, it would not be very clear to you what this is even of. Mm -hmm. You look at it like this and say, oh, it's uh, something, there's a uh, dark thing. Then you get closer and take some care and realize, oh, it's this dog. And then to uh, expand on this, ah, there are some crows drawn up there. Maybe they're just small, maybe they're grayed way back, so they are almost out there. And we have some things to be discovered. But this very bold approach uh, is a lot of fun for me. It, it keeps my interest uh, in the process and allows for the viewer to uh, participate, discover some things. Yeah, for about something <laughs> Stan, one of the things that, that you alluded to is uh, that idea that we bring uh, as part of how do I move from experience into a medium to generate an experience for you is problem solving. You know, that there is uh, a solution that you have to come to. Oh gosh, now, are these? Can you see that now with the lights? Just yeah. All right, hold on. There you go. Oh, there totally got that one. Um, so here was an example, a moment when <coughs> I had I had written something that you know Stan has to solve, and I had to solve it in my own way. Here's a moment when the dog is trying to get the farmer who's in inspecting the barn. He's alarmed the farmer at night. He said, "Hey, you know, not said, uh, you know, bark, bark, bark. Come on, you got to go. You got to go. You got to go. You got to go." And the farmer's like, with his flashlight, "What? Everything's fine. We're all we're all home." And so. That sense, that, that moment of the dog's urgency, the farmer's lack of urgency, him going back to bed, the pile of snow was something that literally I had to hand over to say, can you help, can you help the story, not just paint what I said, but, but how can we communicate this, this problem solve, sorry, how can you problem solve, so that's one of the things you bring besides your talent, this instant in the narrative. Yeah, yeah, and this is, uh, uh, well, here's an example of one that's, uh, or that's solved by composition. And, uh, you know, when you, when you apply that, the, the axiom that I do, 5% detail, uh, composition does a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, you know, they're not gonna render a lot of stuff. So what is the shape of the page? Uh, what is the shape of the action? And this is a good example of that. Uh, there's a tension here, there's a frustration that this guy is just not getting it, he's not coming out. This painting, the dog is turned. The dog wants to go that way and is looking back frustrated. Would you get out here? And all of the shadow lines and the light are doing that same thing. Everything about this painting is going this way, except the farmer. Do you see the 
And you're, I mean, I remember like just the confidence of, like, making sense of all of that yellow splash. Nowhere else, but just all this yellow splash to show the harshness of that other light, that other light, into which the dog is summoning the farmer out of. And again, I, rem I saw, I didn't bring the sketch of this. I remember you had another version of it where you thought that the dog might be, uh, that the, the scene might be the dog way out there. So we're in the barn and the farmers and here's the dog all the way out there like oh, where yeah. Dr. Loud, Murray Loud is. And so we're seeing that same distorted. Right. Yeah, the, uh, there, there is a, uh, you know, for us, we've done this for a long time. And by the way, I, I appreciate your remark about the baker who's made all the bread, and I'm going to write a letter to my mother tonight. Well, I've been telling people, I'm 37 now, she's made 60,000 meals. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, a drill that that I give the students sometimes. So, okay, you take 30 seconds. Just stick figures practically. A person at a coffee shop having coffee, go. Rather predictably, the first drawing is a side view person, coffee go. So, okay, now swing the camera 90 degrees. Do it again. Now swing it another 90. Now back way up. Now zoom way in. Now go overhead. Okay, and now we've got five or six little thumbnails of this person having coffee. Pretty predictably, the most interesting one is not the first one. It's that second. What if I were over here? What if I did this? And that's, uh, as you gain experience, becomes kind of sort of instinctively go to number three or four. But like you say, with this book, uh, or any book, uh, there are options. What about this? What about that? What if we only show the reflection? We don't actually show the subject. It looks like a painting of rocks. Oh, wait. In the reflection of the water, we see the subject. And that it's uh, you know, a passage about something, something. You know. Ah, there we go. I know we need to keep this a tight uh, on a tight kind of schedule, and we want to take questions, which might allow us to uh, hammer home a couple other of the points that I promised you that, that we would make. Uh, so there are about seven, six minutes, but we're going to go over. But are there questions that might uh, allow us to clarify or, or, or reflect in a different way on something that we've said? Um, sure, thank you, thank you. Um, so another couple words about, about the, the Cuckoo's Haiku. Um, and let me just pull this up here. Stan, is there something that immediately strikes you to share about that? Oh, that was a lot of fun. And the, uh, uh, I spend, a, <coughs> like Michael, uh, a great deal of time outside. Uh, one of my resolutions last year is I live in Colorado now, which is perfect. I spend as many days outside as I can. Um, and so, subjects like this, birds and twigs and leaves and things like that, I have enjoyed since I was a little kid. And uh, the, the, the poetry is rather, you know, okay, this and this and this. Well, that gives me some ideas. But beyond that, then, you fall into that daydream. If I were in that meadow, what would I see? What would be some things that are interesting? And you let yourself fall into it and basically daydream with a pencil. And you just, oh, maybe this or maybe that. Uh, that was a really very enjoyable book. Yeah. Uh, but this, for example, and again, a, a compositional thing. Look, let's drop the viewer down into the grass and we'll have a flower that's bigger than the bird. And of course, the bird's obviously a star in this, but that kind of thing happens when you 
get there in your head and say, I am in this metal. Yeah, I love, I love the idea of being uh, jarred and juxtaposed uh, because if this were a picture book as it is of 40 pages and there are 22 birds, if we had the same view and you just you know, replace the bluebird now with the wild turkey and with the wild turkey now, it's that, yeah. that. Uh, let me just think there's another one here that might be. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, sure. Uh, what's this? The owl? Yeah. Yeah, here's a little bit of a lofty uh, solution that I'm surprised they they okay. You know, the barn owl, the, the barn owl, you know, who works for you, you know, that the call. Um, you know, an outdoor camp stove. I thought that's going to be kind of funky. I don't know if they're going to buy that. They love it. Uh, so that was that was a fun thing to. In. Each of these, I think, uh, spin on that idea of being in a field notebook, being out, being present, recording, thinking, and stand had handwritten, and then we ultimately typeset because you were talking earlier. Everybody says, "Oh, please do your handwriting. We love your handwriting." And then, what does it say on page? What did you write there? So, uh, but no, it, it is it is a book that. Uh, is uh, part of, I think, an ongoing, it's not so much a meditation for me, uh, and as Stan says, we share a sort of desire to be outside, to be part of a planet whose uh, resources uh, and citizens aren't just our fellow humans. Um, to be a part of that awareness and to use that awareness to sort of think about um, just that whole process of creating, of, uh, of noticing. I, I wrote a piece recently for an education magazine about how my walks with Chant are half about, well, they're all kinds of things. One quarter, a little fitness going on here. One quarter, uh, let's see if there are any mushrooms to pick. Uh, there are more than that many quarters. But one of them is to perceive what Chant is perceiving. So we don't use a leash. Uh, she, you know, I've trained her very well. And I sort of see what she's seeing. And in fact, I have all kinds of versions of haiku that just base, are, are based on something like, I see chant, leap over a log, leap over a rock, then, then, then leap back and forth over a log. Now, she's not having a spasm. I know there's a reason for her to do this. But I don't see anything. Obviously, there must be a chipmunk, or a mole, or I mean, not a mole, or, or, or some skittering something that she's trying to get. And A, I wouldn't even have noticed anything happening over there, that there was a presence of anything. But I also get to notice through her hearing, like, you know, it's very easy to forget that 90% of the dog's uh, life is not about seeing, which is what ours is. You know, they're mostly hearing and smelling what's going on. So though, you know, though we're see, she does see things while we're on a walk, I have that chance to perceive the environment through a different sensibility. And, and that to me is a, a very rich thing that I've used in writing uh, the haiku, even about birds and horses. Um, I think of them with that, what's the word, with the sort of springboard or that, or that ventriloquism of not necessarily wanting to see it through my eyes. Other questions about other things that Sir? Is the, the Tale of Rescue, is that out now? Yes, the Tale of Rescue came out at the end of October. And and um, I think Marie will, Dr. Loudon Haynes will say that we have copies of that and the Cuckoo's Haiku and Horse People, as well as a lot of original art by Stan, uh, studies from this book, horses, very <coughs> large canvases as well that aren't from the book are all here and all very generously offered at well below any kind of gallery prices here. Other questions? Uh, questions? Yeah, please. When you are writing, do you are you influenced at all by the words you put on the page, thinking about what how he might illustrate what you're writing, or does it change what you write? 
Um, that's, that's very interesting. When I wrote The Tale of Rescue, I had seen paintings such as this by Stan. Now, this is, this is not a great example, but it's the one I happen to have on my computer because this was a tiny, this is a tiny little thumbnail that he did. Uh, there might be another one here. That, that painting is the size of a business card. Uh, did we see this one already? You can see this, the way that he treats, just let's pretend that's a, so I deliberately had, had in my head this idea of, these, of this dog, this landscape that I know because I live on it, and how he might treat it. Not that I was deliberately thinking, oh, I know how he'll do this. He'll draw the dog here, he'll draw the dog there. Um, but I did have him, and in fact, when I turned in the manuscript, I said two things. One, I don't want to see the people's faces. So there's a mother, a father, and a boy. And that's all they're known as in the whole book, a mother, father, and their son, a boy. And until the end, the dog is the dog. There's a dog. Nothing has a name. And that's important to the story, which we, I don't want to go into. <clears throat> that, sounded, that sounded harsher. I mean, it, it takes too long to really <laughs> talk about. Um, but turning over to Stan, I did have this sense of I know how he often can do faces like here was one solution where there's no lack of detail, but we don't we don't see the faces, nor are we missing the faces. Like why you know why why do you have the mother's hand in front of her face? Right. Yeah, that uh, that one where they're scrambling over the fence. That's handy. Maybe not. Um, Yeah, that's a, a, a trick. Um, you know, how can you carry the story forward and keep veiling who these people actually are? And it's uh, honestly, you know, parameters like that make it interesting. If someone says, well, just paint whatever you want, where do I even begin? That's too many choices. If someone says, paint this person but don't show their face and can be some emotion and advance the storyline. Now that's interesting. And in this case, you know, here's a scene where oh, there's some relief and the gesture of the family of tired, sick of this whole thing, but giving some comfort to this kid uh, and carrying forward is, is all conveyed in their gesture and in the composition. Okay, now you have to do it again. Uh, we're gonna arrive someplace else. How do we do this and keep it fresh? That's, you know, a, a thing like that, uh, a, uh, a detail about the assignment, you must do this, it's really what makes it interesting. It's part of the puzzle. Yeah, we, we were talking about a Charles's law of gas. You know, how a, a something expands to fill the, the space that it cut off. <coughs> off. And I think in, in some ways, you don't want a room, you want the pressure, you want the molecules to have to be bouncing harder and faster. You want the energy that comes from limitation, not, oh, whatever you want, as long as you want. Anything you're thinking of, oh, anything but that. Yeah, no, that, that, that really keeps it, it keeps it very interesting. A uh, couple other thoughts from anyone over there in the mezzanine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I have another one. We are traditionally taught that authors and illustrators never see each other, never know each other. How do you two have the ability and? How are you allowed to do this post relationship? Did everyone hear the question well enough? Uh, the question was basically typically the Maza trainees are taught, hey, authors and illustrators, there's a wall between them, they don't communicate, they don't know each other, they do their work independently. The art director deals with him, the editor deals with me, and never the twain shall meet. How did we find a workaround? They look at me. 
I I'm a, I'm a, yeah, I just I, I I think there's a that is a good question and you're right. That is that is typically the, the deal. Uh, we are very fortunate uh, being very good friends. We talk all the time. <coughs> Think of two uh, musicians, uh, jazz musicians, a pianist and a guitar player. And he starts out with a piece, and I know, uh, I'll wait a little bit. And people expect me to come in now and wait a little longer. And now I'm going to come in. He knows that too. And our publisher knows that. And I think that is, uh, it's not Michael and I collaborating directly, but playing harmony, taking turns with the lead. And the publisher, who is very good, knows this. They say, oh, these two knuckleheads. <laughs> Put them together. And to, your, and to your credit, we don't. I mean, Stan, like Stan now has 34 or haiku from me. Is that how many there are? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do next month. So, you know, he is not going to call me and say, "Hey, you know the one about the horse that's eating the apple under the willow tree, or whatever it would be." I didn't really understand what you meant. Did you mean that the willow should be this or that? He's going to talk to the art director. He's going to do his sketches, and if there actually turns out to be a problem, I'll get a query from someone else, because the last thing they want, and this is why, is, you know what, Stan, when you draw the little girl, I really want it to look like my niece, Stephanie, and I want curly yellow hair. You know, and then Stan goes, oh, okay, I totally will do that. And then the art director says, I need a really dark hair, you know, it's like, well, the author doesn't, look, we can't all direct the show, right? <laughs> this, in fact, is why Stan got to the tale of rescue. Uh, and the process was simple, Candlewick, with whom I have a great relationship, said, would we be interested in your ideas for who might illustrate this? So I submitted his name. So did the art director. So did the three uh, uh, art assistant directors, oh, right. whatever yeah. they're called. Yeah. So did the editor, and so did the assistant editor. So there were 16 people on the, on the roster, and everybody presented a slideshow of, of, oh, I love this, oh, I love this, oh, I love this, oh, I love this, and then they voted. Not me, they all voted, however many there were, seven of them. And without Stan noses, they picked someone else. I was heart sick, you know, I was like, and I said, look, it's fine with me, but we've seen no dogs, this, this artist has painted us, no dogs, no animals even, that we could see. And this is a book all about an animal. Can we see a sample? Feeling a little guilty sharing this. He sent two rounds of samples, and no one liked them. Not the editor, not the art director, not me. And so they finally said, hey, thank you so much, but I just don't think this is. Now, to be fair, uh, we're going to ask Stan to do a sample, even though we've done. So Stan sent in this sample, and they were immediately like, we're so sorry. We waited to ask you. <laughs> You know, I, was, I was honored to be asked uh, in what was coming. I, did, I didn't know the story. I mean, I knew there was this other person and some problems, some frustrations, some things. And then they said, Just paint us a dog, would you? It's <coughs> a particular dog. All right. It was, it was like the uh, Bugs Bunny cartoons where he puts the thing in the mail and the guy shows up with the truck. And it was like that. Okay, here you go. Bing. Yeah, you got it. So, you know, I thought it was going to be like committee and talking and whatnot. You may already be a winner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I submitted this thing and they called me right back and said, that's it. <coughs> um, la la I really, someone should tell me to stop because I, I have no sense of that we need to do anything. But, but still the same topic. The yes. first time that we did both together, was that? arranged by the editor? Or did you already know each other or not? Okay, so uh, now I'll, fe I'll fess up. So I've done illustration work myself over the years, and I edited a lot of books that luckily uh, Harcourt at the time let me choose illustrators 
so speak, I picked 43 different illustrators. I told them, hey, these are the ones I'm thinking of. Are you OK with all this? And I also said, if you have anyone in your stable you would like to contribute. And so Stan was someone I found as an editorial illustrator who hadn't been working uh, with me before, but I had seen two books he did with Rabbit Ears, um, publisher, and lots of magazine work. And I wrote and said, would you participate in this book? And he said, yes. So we got acquainted that way. Our first book then that I, again, asked the publisher, hey, could we do this together, was this one, The Dog Who Walked With God, which is a retelling of a Cato uh, people creation story, um, which ha has, not coincidentally, <laughs> Chant starring. <laughs> No, not Jim. Well, it seems to me that um, you were already, you know, a publisher pretty well then, at that point, right? Sure. So it, 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 it has occurred to me that you almost have to be well known before you can choose or suggest who the illustrator is. Is that true? Again, I think it's it's I probably it's different. The most combination of like villains, but you know, um, I've done a lot of things. Almost need to be already established before the editor kind of will go with author. I think it, de it depends from editor to editor and house to house. There are still places where I don't, I don't. They don't ask for suggestions. <coughs> They'll pass it by me, but I'm really not supposed to, unless I have some tremendous objection. Like I happen to know. <coughs> that they're never deliver on time. You know, some, some fundamental misgiving, I just go with it. Doctor? It's obvious that they are kindred spirits, isn't it? And we are the beneficiaries of their gifts. Let's give them a round of applause. for sale and there's a table for autographing in the Great Hall. Please enjoy and we hope to see you back here again soon. Thank you.